Paul the Apostle says, for the love of Christ, Jesus' love in our hearts, compels us. That's our motivation. Because we judge thus, that if one died, that's Jesus, for all, then all died. In other words, all can be saved. And he died for all, that those who live, that's us, should live no longer for themselves. That's my problem. How about you? But for him, for Jesus, who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Paul knew and had heard of Jesus as a man, but he doesn't know him just as a man anymore. He knows him as God Almighty, the Son of God. What he's saying is we no longer should see anyone just as a person. We should see them as Jesus sees them. Someone who can be reconciled and know him like we do. A few more verses. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now here comes your call and my call to the full-time 24-7 ministry for our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation, the gospel. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Now remember communion at the end of service. For he, the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. Okay, now, if you'll turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 2, verse 1. John chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to look at the very first miracle that Jesus performed in his public ministry. Actually, the very first miracle he performed ever here on earth. So it's John chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to study the first 11 verses. And the miracles that our Lord Jesus performed, they are one of the most powerful and convincing proofs of his deity. In other words, Jesus is God. And the miracles are one of the most powerful and convincing proofs of that. He performed many miracles of the many. The Holy Spirit, we're studying the Gospel of John, led and inspired the Apostle John to include just seven in this whole 21 chapter Gospel, only seven miracles that was led of the Holy Spirit. For a reason, all seven of those have the intention of pointing to Jesus as being the Son of God, God the Son, being God Almighty. Now, that list of seven doesn't include the greatest miracle, the greatest proof that Jesus is Almighty God, and that's his resurrection that we're going to celebrate in two weeks here on Easter Sunday morning. And so I want to encourage you to invite somebody to come and to hear the gospel. That would make eight if you included the resurrection. If we took all of the combined miracles that are recorded, and we know they're not even close to the total number that he actually recorded. If you took all four gospels and you put them together, it's not an exhaustive list. And you guys, there were certainly many occasions, right, when Jesus did more than even seven miracles in one day. We have seven in the whole gospel that John chooses. There were many times Jesus did more than seven in one day. When he was at the home of Peter and Andrew on the Sea of Galilee, Galilee in Capernaum, it says at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. By the way, let's not go past that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every church that names his name and our entire area here, if the whole city, every city would be gathered at the door of every church. Isn't that beautiful? Then he, Jesus, healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So we're going to look at a wedding today. A wedding was a major social event in the days of Jesus, and the celebration in those days could last from a couple of days up to a week in length of celebration. Now, they did it right back then because the groom was responsible for the expenses of the celebration. Don't you think that's right? It's biblical, okay? That's the way it was. 
I always think it could be retro, okay? It could always be retroactive because I have three daughters and it, it isn't that way in our, in our country and all our culture, but anyway. God richly rewarded me with my three sons in law. I praise him for them. So, the fact, we're going to read this. We're going to see that both Jesus and his mother Mary were invited to this wedding. That suggests to us that this wedding involved relatives or friends of the family of Joseph and Mary and Jesus and his brothers and sisters. Now, the wedding feast at Cain of Galilee gave Jesus the opportunity to present himself as the Son of God, God the Son. So let's read the 11 verses through and then we'll get into the teaching. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, sounds harsh, huh? It's not. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Isn't that great? Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. That's a lot. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And notice, and his disciples believed in him. So let's look at verse 1 and 2. Again, it says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus uh, and his mother were invited and the disciples. Now, when it says on the third day, the question naturally arises, as you and I read that, from what day was it the third day? And the third day here was the third day after the last event described in the preceding chapter. We looked at it last week in chapter one. And we're going to, I'm going to have you jump up there, but it links our story directly with the events described. If you'll look back up at John chapter one, verse 43, just above probably where you're reading now. We studied that together last Sunday morning. And it says in verse 43, the following day, Beautiful phrase here. You can circle it. Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. We talked about that last week. Jesus wanted to, what? Fill it in the gap in your life. And he found Philip. So in other words, they're heading for Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, jump, skip verse 44, jump down to verse 45. We'll read just the first three words. It says, Philip found Nathaniel. And that was our story last week. And Nathaniel also followed Jesus as his disciple. And so the third day in our story today that it's talking about would be the third day after Jesus and his new disciples had set out for Galilee. It's the third day right after the call of Philip and Nathaniel's disciples, and they're heading up to Galilee. They're setting out from the south, down by the River Jordan in Judea, where John the Baptist, Baptist is baptizing, and they're going to Galilee in the north, up by the Sea of the Galilee, and you guys, it's a journey on foot of about 70 to 75 miles. So as they're heading north, Jesus now has what? Six believing men with him, six disciples. And these six men would also be chosen later from a large group of disciples to be six of the 12 apostles. There were disciples and then there was 12 apostles. And then also from the six that he already has with him right now, Three of those six were to be numbered as his chief apostles. There were times where he took Peter, James, and John just with himself. So he has these six men with him. Andrew, John, Peter, James, Philip, and Nathaniel. And they're heading up north. And by the way, we saw you know, Nathaniel follow Jesus in our story last week. He is from Cana, where they're going to the wedding. And that's about 10 miles away north of Nazareth where Jesus grew up. So 
Very wise decision for whoever was arranging this marriage, as we're going to see, to invite Jesus. It is still a very wise decision when couples today invite our Lord Jesus Christ to be the center of their marriage. In order for our Lord to be truly invited to a wedding or to a marriage, both the bride and groom must be tr true believers in Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 1. We're told here there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and it says, and the mother of Jesus was there. But you guys, nothing to said of Joseph, who we know was Mary's husband, right? And he was Jesus' earthly stepfather. How come Joseph isn't there? We read nothing about Joseph in Scripture after we read in Luke's Gospel, the family took a trip for the Passover to Jerusalem when Jesus was 12. That's the last time we see Joseph in Scripture. It's believed that he has passed away at this time, because at the cross, John the Apostle, who wrote this gospel, is there with Mary. And they come to the foot of the cross. And Jesus gives Mary, his mother, into the care of John. Now, Joseph is alive. Right? That isn't going to happen. Because Joseph, her husband's going to take care of her. Now, when they're there at the foot of the cross in John 19, it says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman... Behold your son. Now remember we just read the story and Jesus called her woman uh, at the wedding and we said sounds harsh but it's not. At the cross he's giving the care of his mother into John's care and he uses that same term, woman, you see. Now, way back when when Jesus was born as a baby, after the days of her purification, which would have been 40 plus days, in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph would have left. They traveled to Jerusalem, took Jesus to present him in the temple and to offer up the prescribed sacrifices for after a baby was born. By the way, when that was done, they went back to Bethlehem. And that's when the wise men came, when Jesus was maybe between a year and two years old. They stayed there for a while. Well, when they bring Jesus in, Simeon, this godly man, is there. It says, and he takes him up in his arms because the Lord tells him, he had told him, you're not going to die before you see the Messiah. And he comes in, this baby, and he knows it's him. He takes him up in his arms and he begins to speak prophecy about Jesus. And it says, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things that were spoken of him. Now listen, this is real, um, this is a clue. Then Simeon, now they're both standing there, right? Joseph and Mary, blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. Not Joseph, Mary, his mother. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. And then he tells Mary, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What was he talking about? He was talking about when she would stand there at the foot of her, the cross watching her son die and he would commit her into the care of John. But was her heart broken and was like a sword was through her heart as she watched her son suffer the horrible death of crucifixion. That's what he was talking about. Don't make the mistake, though, of thinking that when he said that, Mary understood that that's what he was talking about. That's a veiled prophecy. In other words, a sword will pierce. So Mary goes, oh, he's going to die on the cross. She didn't know that. But you know what would happen with the word of God? And that's what the Holy Spirit does when she stood there that day. Wouldn't it be true that the Holy Spirit would have then brought that prophecy to Simeon back? And, and she would say, oh my gosh, he told me a sword will pierce my own soul. Well, she was the virgin mother of God. He was conceived, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. But Joseph was his earthly stepfather. And all of the adoptive parents that I have ever met in my life love their adopted children as much as any of us loves um, children that are born physically to us. And a lot of times, parents, you can say, well, which of your children are adopted? Oh, I forget. I forget. They're all the same. The point is, Joseph would have loved Jesus just like Mary. So wouldn't it be true that if he was at the foot of the cross and still alive, that a sword would have pierced his own soul also? See, it's just a subtle clue. Simeon turns to Mary, not Joseph, and says, a sword shall pierce your own soul. So we know that between... Even this wedding, when Jesus is 30 years old and beginning his public ministry, Joseph has passed away. But just stop right there and just think this thought. A lot of people will say Jesus 
did miracles when he was a little boy and a baby, and you have fanciful tales of that. We're going to see from our passage today that's not true. It's proven by the word of God. At some point, Jesus, the Son of God, Almighty God, God in the flesh, his earthly father, Joseph, passed away. Why did he not heal him? I don't know. He didn't, though, did he? Right? Think of that, because God, none of us... Um, leaves this earth and until we have a divine appointment and God takes us. But he, Jesus' earthly father had died. So sometimes people say everybody's supposed to be healed. Joseph wasn't healed, whatever happened, you see? And yet he was the earthly father, stepfather of Jesus. Well, let's look at verse three. They're at the wedding and it says, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, Mary must have been really close to either the bride or the bridegroom to, number one, have such a personal concern for the success of the celebration. And number two, to even know the fact that the supply of wine was depleted. And we'll see why in just a moment. She probably and might have been helping in the preparation and serving of the meal at this reception. Now, we've got this word today. I don't use it a lot, but we hear this word faux pas, right? And it's a French word. And uh, we kind of know what, it's mean, what it means, but I looked it up anyway. It's French for an embarrassing social mistake. So at the time of Jesus, to run out of wine at a wedding was a social faux pas, right? A social mistake that could become the subject of this village of Cana's jests and jokes for years to come. Nothing could be more devastating at a wedding in those days than for this to happen it would be a bitter disgrace. And it's such an embarrassment, it could have been a stigma that would stick with that family, with both families, bride and groom for the rest of their lives. Well, Alfred Adersheim, who lived in the 1800s, was a Jewish man, a Jewish historian, also a believer who loved Jesus Christ as Lord. And he says that those six stone water pots in our story would have been located outside the reception room within the home where the wedding was held. Now that, that's the custom of the day because those pots were used for ceremonial cleansing. The guests would come, they would wash their hands. In between courses of the meal, they would wash their hands. The dishes would be washed without water. Those pots with water would be outside the reception in another room, unseen. And that's what he says. And so that leads us to believe that as Mary and Joseph are now speaking and she says they've run out of wine, right? That this isn't happening, this conversation inside the reception. We know now from what we're reading that it's taking place just outside that room, behind the scenes. That's how I've always pictured it when I've read this. How about you? By the way, this is one of the best known stories in the Bible by Christians and non-Christians. A lot of non-Christians know this story. Now, she says to Jesus, they run out of wine. Mary's expectations would have been greatly awakened. Question, do you have great expectation of Jesus right now in your life? And do I? Are you expecting him to move to answer your prayers? Mary had great expectation. We already learned the whole nation knew John the Baptist was preaching and he was saying Messiah was coming. You've got to remember Mary had been visited by Gabriel, the angel, and he had told her that her baby, she was a virgin and was going to conceive and that she was going to conceive by a miracle of the Holy Spirit filling her and coming upon her, a miracle, a quiet miracle within her and that her baby would be the son of God. And then she said, your relative Elizabeth, who's very old in age and has been barren all of her life, is now six months pregnant. Mary gets up immediately. She says, let it be done unto me according to your word. In other words, what you want to do, God, do in my life. And we know the story. But it says she gets up immediately and she goes into the hill country of Judea. And when she walks into the home, immediately, she, Elizabeth, I'm here. And when Elizabeth hears her voice, John the Baptist, who's six months along in her womb, leaps for joy. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, to me, the most amazing example in Scripture of the gift of the word of knowledge that God gives, and he still gives today. And she says, why is this? She says, blessed are you among women, and, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. 
Why is this that the mother, of, it's been granted to me that the, the mother of my Lord would come? So Mary was, is, is just a few weeks pregnant maybe at this time, maybe even a week. Elizabeth knows you're expecting a baby. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. He's the Lord. He's my Lord. And also when my baby heard your voice, he leaped with joy because Elizabeth and Zacharias already knew that their baby was John the Baptist who was going to go before Jesus. Mary knew all of this. It's been 30 hard years of living under the cloud of people whispering that her and Joseph, right, had conceived out of wedlock. And she had lived under those rumors for 30 years. She's, her expectation is greatly awakened, but she knows that her son is God in the flesh. Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine. You guys, listen, do you hear what she's saying? She's saying they've run out of wine. No, do, you, do we really hear what she's saying? You know what she's saying? She's saying, they need you. They need you. They need you. They have great need and you are the answer. Mary knows two things. First, she knows the heart of Jesus Christ, her son. Second, she knows who he is and that he can do anything. Let me tell you this morning, Jesus loves you with an everlasting love and he has all power. That means, number one, he's willing because he loves you and two, he is able. Trust him with all of your heart. If you'll look with me at verse four, it says, Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. This response seems a little abrupt and even harsh to us, but it isn't. Woman was an expression in those days of respect and affection, not one of abuse. In that culture, that title woman, it wasn't mean or rude or disrespectful, but listen, it was important. It was an expression of polite distance. What do you mean? So now you're gonna put a polite distance. You called your mother, not mother, but woman. It wasn't a customary address for someone's mother for you to call your mother woman. But mother, the word mother is precisely what Jesus did not choose to call Mary. And he says in verse four, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. In the Greek language in which the New Testament is written, the idea is that, it, and Jesus says to her, what is that to me and to you, woman? It means, what have we in common? Now, Listen carefully, Jesus and Mary, they're gonna continue their wonderful relationship of mother and son, but something has now happened in the life of Jesus which must make a difference to their former relationship. Mary needs a savior, just like us. By the way, she just starts praising God when she comes into Elizabeth's house. And she, and she says, blessed is God, my savior. She needs a savior just like us. Jesus. Something's happened to our relationship. Jesus is gently but firmly teaching Mary that now in the performance of his divine mission, he's not subject to instructions from his mother, but he acted he's, and now going to act entirely in obedience to the will of his father in heaven. He only has, uh, a, there's only one voice that has authority for his ear and that's the father in heaven. So he's saying to his mom, Dear woman, your maternal authority does not extend into the realm of my messianic work. And Mary needed to learn that. Now, Alfred Edersheim, that Jewish scholar, he said there was one thing which Mary had learned and one thing which she was to unlearn. After 30 years of raising Jesus, what she had learned and what she must have learned was, you guys, absolute confidence in Jesus. She knew that. She had learned that. But what she had to unlearn was the natural Yet he says entirely mistaken impression, which the meekness of Jesus, his stillness, the way he was submitted to her and Joseph all those years, that the relationship is the same way. That's what she had to unlearn, right? The he says the fundamental mistake in what she attempted is just this, that she spoke as his mother this day at the wedding. She's speaking as his mother. And she placed that maternal relationship in connection with his work. And the Lord is gently but firmly trying to correct her, and he will keep doing that throughout his ministry. 
Do you remember? Let's go back to the last time we saw Joseph. When they went up to that Passover, they left. They trusted Jesus. He stayed back. They got a day's journey. They realized he wasn't there. They headed back. And the third day, they found him in the temple, sitting amongst the teachers, right? Asking them questions and answering. And they were amazed with Jesus at 12 years old. Mary says, son, when they found him, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Then it says he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother Mary kept all these things in her heart. Now, if we take the same story that's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we put it together, it would read like this. Because in the middle of Jesus' ministry, he's still trying to teach this to Mary. It says, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And standing outside, they sent to him calling him. So the house is packed full of people. They're outside looking in the windows. They're on the outside of that. They send a message. Hey, send a message through to my son. See, it's kind of like the wedding, right? They run out of wine and she's still learning, right? That her relationship is, has to change with him. And a multitude was sitting around him in the house and they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them saying, who is my mother or my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and he looked around in a circle at all those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. In other words, my family, there's the family of God, the church is what he's saying. Those who hear the word of God and obey. These six new disciples of Jesus heard Mary say this to Jesus. They heard him correct her in his response to her. They watched him reorder her relationship with him because they needed to see and understand that also because they're his disciples. They also heard Jesus say, my hour has not yet come, giving them as well as Mary the beginning of an understanding that Jesus is on a heavenly timetable of obedience marked out for him by his heavenly father. Well, let's look at verse five. These are the last recorded words of Mary in the Bible. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. What great counsel. Those six new disciples also heard Mary say this. Now, question. Jump back up to John 143 again. And it says the following day, what do you want, Lord? Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. And we already talked about how now they're up there at the wedding. Why did Jesus want to go to Galilee? It says Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. Was it to go to a wedding? Would it be all that way for the sake of providing for a bride and a groom in their distress? Do you know we're going to get to John 4 in, in just a little while. Story of the woman at the well with Jesus. He was down in the south again at that time. And it says he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Well, Judea's in the south, Samaria's in the middle, Galilee's in the north. Samaria, when Israel had been taken captive, they had left people in the land, the Babylonians. They had intermarried and they weren't purely Jewish. Those were the Samaritans, the Jews in the north, the Jews in the south, and they both hated each other. If you were traveling north to south or south to north, you didn't go straight through Samaria. You went all the way around, even though it was a long journey. But it says Jesus, he needed to go through Samaria. Why? Oh, because he's in a hurry, right? He's late and he's in a hurry. He was never in a hurry. He was never late. He was always on the Father's timetable. Why did he need to go through Samaria? Because there was a woman there who would be by herself at the well and she needed a savior. And then she would end up bringing the whole village to him. So he went all the way through Samaria. He needed to go there for that one woman and to do his work because that woman had a desperate need for him. And now there's this couple who have a desperate need for they have run out 
of wine and great embarrassment. And it's kind of hanging, I think, in the balance right there. Does this couple know yet? I think they do. I think the guy, the master of the feast knows too. And it's that few minutes of what are we going to do when this happens, right? Because it's always God's timing. I wonder if you feel that you're in desperate need this morning. By the way, I think we always are. We just don't always have that felt need. It's a great place to be, to feel like you need him desperately. Because that's when we turn to him with all of our heart. Now, what a Lord, what a Savior. Jesus values the groom's honor. The groom, right? He's responsible. He has a desperate need. The Lord Jesus is full of kindness, compassion, love, understanding, and, and he acted because of that. When we read in the Gospels, whenever Jesus would see people, it says he was moved with compassion because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus, Lord, King of glory, Almighty God, uses his time and his power to save a humble Galilean wedding couple from humiliation. They're in an impossible situation, right? You know what I wrote down here? You can't just create wine out of nothing, right? We're out of wine. What do we do? You just can't create it out of nothing, right? But Jesus is there. Does your situation seem impossible right now? There's a lot going on right now in everyone we know, right? And in this church and just lots of extreme things and trials going on. If your situation seems impossible, take heart for Jesus loves you. Mary didn't know what Jesus would do, but she knew that the situation is now saved because it had been committed into the hands of Jesus. You guys, can we know that very same thing with our situations without knowing what he will do? You know, intercession, it has been said, intercession is love at prayer. We read 2 Corinthians that we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. Friday morning, I told the men, God's calling us to pray. And then I said, you know, you hear sometimes, I don't see it in the Bible really clearly. Some people will say when it describes all the gifts, the different gifts that God disperses and gives us all different gifts to serve him because every member is a minister. Some people will say some people are given this ministry of prayer intercession and God gives them that ministry. That's true. There are prayer warriors and there's intercession and it's really a ministry. But what I told the men, I don't see that. And I think what it is, is that God gives every person here who knows him that ministry of intercessory prayer. There are just some who pick it up and take it. And some of us who don't like we should. Wait a minute. Didn't we read at the beginning that everyone has been given the ministry of reconciliation? which means bringing someone to Jesus and seeking to bring them together that they might be saved. Undeniably, we all have that ministry. We read it. Wouldn't that then mean that we all have a ministry of prayer and intercession, that we would be praying for those people to be saved? Amen. So now we know we have a, a ministry of reconciliation and we have been given a ministry of intercession also to pray unceasingly for other people. Now, Mary is a beautiful and simple example of intercessory prayer. We all have a tendency when we pray, try to direct God. Here's what we want you to do. Our part is just to lay the need before him, like Mary is here. Then trust him to respond as he wills. Now, remember, Mary's expectations have been greatly awakened. She is anticipating that Jesus would respond. Are you? Am I? I am. But I can go like this all week long, up and down. But right now this morning, I'm anticipating and I'm expecting. And it has been a blessing to be in the Word of God and have my eyes on Jesus. For He has lifted me up and I have felt my desperate need. And He is there. And He's faithful. Just turn to Him this morning. That's all. Just say, Lord, help me. Isn't that what Mary was saying? You know, we don't have to pray long. I mean, God will move if I really pray long for you. Or you really pray long for me. All we have to do is think of each other and say, Lord, please help them. And he knows what to do. That's powerful. Power goes forth. That's all we have to do. That's all Mary was doing. They need you. They're out of wine. God's calling us to pray. Question, is there someone you and I have stopped praying for? 
there is in my life. That's why I'm asking the question. Because the Holy Spirit convicted me that. Next question. I have to ask myself, why? And sometimes it's because it didn't go your way. You know what I'm saying? We can stop praying for people. Don't get discouraged. Well, look at verse 6. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Six times 20 is 120. Six times 30 is 180 gallons. But it says 20 or 30. So let's split it. Three times 20 is 60. Three times 30 is 90. Add it together. Probably an average of 150 gallons of water. Right? That these pots can hold. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And this is how we're to serve the Lord with all of our heart. And it says, and they filled them up to the brim. What we need to see here is that Jesus gives the servants a simple command. Fill the water pots with water. Without a word, the servants respond and do exactly as he said. It says, and they filled them up to the brim. Simple command equals simple obedience. Without a word, they move. But you guys, you know what I stop and wonder? You and I are the servants there. And he says, we know they're out of wine. We're in the back room. Jesus and his mother are there. His disciples are there. And we're there as servants. And all of us... And maybe the master of the feast knows, and maybe the groom and bride know, but nobody else knows. And again, it's probably hanging right there in midair. What's going to happen here? We are desperate. And Mary says, whatever he says to you, do it. And the servants don't know him. And he says, fill those jars with water. Without a word, you immediately begin to obey. But what are you thinking, right? Maybe it's what we're thinking in our life right now. You know, they move, right? And, and they're going to do it. But I would be thinking, why fill the water pots with water, right? This doesn't make any sense. And what is he doing? Kind of sounds like our lives sometimes. Now, it's going to take the servants a little bit of time to go from the well with smaller vessels, fill those up. They don't have a spigot. They've got to fill it up. It's going to take a few minutes, a little bit of time. Interesting, the fact that they filled them up to the brim left no room to put anything else in there so no one can make an accusation that some hocus pocus or some trick was played. They filled them up and that detail confirms the miracle. But Mary, the six disciples, are there watching and they must be in suspense, right? Until the water pots are completely filled. Are you and I in suspense right now? Trusting Him, believing in Him, expecting Him to move. Are we in suspense because we have brought our prayer to Him, watching and believing He's going to do something because it is now in His hands and He wants us to give Him everything this morning. Were the disciples there? Yes, they were. We know they were observers and in that back room because jump down to verse 11 again. It says, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So we know they were there. Now, look at verse 8, if you would please. And he, Jesus, said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. It was probably at this moment, we don't know, but probably right here that the miracle took place. Now you guys, Jesus doesn't touch the water pots. He doesn't speak a command. He doesn't pray to his father by a mere act of his will. He changes the water into wine. And that same almighty power of God, that power of his will that we see him display here is still exercised on your half, your behalf and mine is believing people today in what response to prayer. So, Check it out. That which is poured into the water pots was water. That which was drawn out was wine. But to the one who created the grapes in the first place, is this difficult or hard? There's nothing even hard for God, and Jesus is God. He who could create matter out of nothing could, could much more easily change one kind of matter, water, into another, wine. Again, the Lord gives them a simple command, and they obey it. Draw some out, and they do exactly as it says, but notice it says that they took it. And we can think, okay, so here's my question. If what was carried to the master of the feast to taste was simply a sampling of the wine in a cup, then why couldn't one servant be sufficient to carry it to him? It says they 
took it to the master of the feast. Don't know for sure. That detail is in there. That leads me to think, though, that each of the servants in the back room now come out into the reception, possibly carrying a small, smaller vessel full of the new wine. They each have one. As they together go to the master of the feast, they're ready to serve it as soon as he has tasted it and given it his approval. You guys, the Lord unfolds his plan for you and I the same way as he did the servants of this wedding, right? One step at a time. First, fill the water pots with water. Lord, what are you doing? No, I'm not going to do that. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know why you're doing it. And this doesn't make sense. Whatever he says to you, do it. That's great counsel. Amen. When they obey that step, he gives them the second one. Now take it out. Right? And he takes it up. Man. Such a large amount of wine, more than enough to last for the rest of the celebration. But you guys, not only did Jesus rescue this bride and groom from embarrassment, the leftover wine after this reception would have provided them with a generous wedding present. He would have provided for them because God, his grace is so abundant. What are they thinking now? I'm wondering. You and I are the servants there. We filled him with water. Draw some out now. We fill our, and we're looking down, and the water that was white is now red. Oh my gosh, what are we thinking now as we're going into the reception, right? This is a miracle. Who is this man? I am drawn to him. I want to follow this man. Only God could do something like this, right? Now they're going to be in anticipation of seeing the reaction of the master of the feast when he tastes it. Now, listen carefully. Jesus made real wine out of this water. It was real wine. Some people say, oh, no, it was grape juice. It wasn't fermented. No, you guys, it was real wine. But listen carefully. Great difference between the wine of their day and the alcoholic mixtures which today go under the name of wine in our day. Their simple vintage was taken and mixed with at least three parts of water. They would drink it as a beverage every day. And so it's always thought of in Scripture as a mixed drink, mixed with water, right? Several instances in the Old Testament, a distinction is made between wine and strong drink. Wine was diluted and mixed with water. Strong drink was wine that was undiluted. That was unacceptable in Israel in those days. Now, there was a danger of drinking water alone because many beverages were not safe to drink. In other words, the water wasn't pure, right? So they tried boiling it. That would work. Took a lot of time, very costly in wood, to boil it, right? Different methods of filtr filtration were tried. Um, Brandon, can you close that door for me, please? Can you guys feel that breeze coming out? It's, going, it's cold up here, and now I know why, because I can hear it raining. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so what do you do? You know the safest and the easiest method of making water safe to drink was to mix it with wine. So it's a safety measure. Now, the rabbis in those days said that any unblessed food, if you ate food that had not been blessed, then the food was unclean and it would defile you as the eater. And they taught that wine, unless it's mixed with water, could not be blessed. But they would debate about how much water to mix with the wine. And some of them said at least three parts water. And others would say, other rabbis would say 10 parts water and one part wine. So you can see what's happening here. You know what it would make us realize, and it would surely seem that in keeping with the custom and tradition of the day, that the water that Jesus turned into wine was mixed in that miracle by Jesus himself in the performing of this miracle so that it would not defile the people present and would be eligible to receive the blessing of the rabbis who were present. He would have mixed it with water. Well, let's look at verse 9. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from. Notice in parentheses, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. You know what I love, you guys? My favorite part of these two verses is that parentheses. Nobody knew, only a few. The master of the feast didn't know, but in parentheses it says what? But the servants who had drawn the water knew. In the parentheses, 
The Lord wants there to be parentheses in your life and mine. What are you doing to serve the Lord? Are you obeying Him? Are you doing whatever He says? That's beautiful. Even those parentheses are kind of, it's hidden within the parentheses, right? And I'm looking at everybody here and there's many things that you do for the Lord that no one else knows, but He knows. But He's calling us to serve Him. Our last verse, let's look at verse 11. It says, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This beginning of signs. When Peter's preaching his first sermon in the book of Acts at Pentecost, that day when the Holy Spirit baptized them, he said, men of Israel, hear, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you. Now listen, three words. By miracles, wonders, and our word today. Signs which God did through him in your midst. Miracles speak about the manifestation of power that's evident. Wonders speak about the effect upon us when we see that miracle. Signs emphasize the significance. In other words, it's like pointing to something. A sign is something that points beyond itself to something greater. All seven miracles in John are called signs. They were chosen by the Holy Spirit and given to John the Apostle because they are, they are signs. Why? Because they're the point to Jesus. And what are they meant to show? That he is the Son of God. Jesus is Almighty God. That's the purpose of the Gospel of John. And so this beginning of signs Jesus did. Now it says... Um, that his, that his disciples believed in him. They had already believed in him, right? What it's talking about is their faith, seeing this miracle, is confirmed. This man, Jesus, is worthy to be believed. When it says his disciples believed in him, it means an unreserved transfer of trust from oneself to someone else. Are you here this morning? Have you had an unreserved Transfer here, Lord. I can't make it to heaven on my own. I'm going to trust you and believe in you. You took my place on the cross. You died for my sins. Do you know a transfer can happen right now? If that hasn't happened, you need to receive him. And that transfer needs to happen in your heart that as, as we celebrate communion. Well, I'm going to stop right there. And before we celebrate communion, if I can have your attention. We're going to turn the lights down low. We're going to begin to worship. Dave's going to come forward and help me. We're going to take the lids off of the communion elements. And as soon as this first song starts, I would invite you to get up out of your chair and come and take the communion elements and go back to your seat and receive it when you're ready. We're not going to receive all together. You just close your eyes. Have a close time with the Lord and when you're ready to receive that. We're remembering that he died on the cross for us. His blood was shed for us. That's the grape juice. His body was broken for us. That's the bread. If you're not a believer here yet, and I'm just thinking there could be one or more here right now, or you're not sure, or listen, whatever he says to you, do it. You have not been doing that. Simple command, we're not following the Lord. Right now, you can, in your own heart of hearts, pray this to Him and rededicate your life to Him. Start afresh and move right now before you come up and get communion. For this represents Him washing away all of our sins. So we don't want to come up here. This is serious. If we're not a Christian, and if we're a Christian, we don't want to come up here if we're sinning and we're coming up because everyone's watching and we're going to take this, but we have no intention of stopping the sin that he's bringing to your mind right now that I don't even know about, but that he's bringing to your mind right now. This represents him saying, I want to make you clean and whole and wash you. Give him that.